Now, in this chapter as well, you've got a section on changing minds, which I found particularly, uh, particularly interesting. Uh, you talk about things like uh, funding bias and uh, people having difficulty changing their minds. Maybe talk about the funding bias first, Claire. Uh, Claire. What, what, what is the issue with, with funding? So, I mean, it, it's a really, really tricky one, this, because I don't have solutions particularly to the problem. But we have a... Um, in science, you can't be a scientist unless you've got money to do the work. And so that money has to come from somewhere... And like the large, large swathes of medical research is, are funded either by the Wellcome Trust or by the Medical Research Council, which is government funded. But, you know, there are other sources of, of funding, but those are the two biggies. And what you find is that the people who are making the decisions about whether, how that, that money should be allocated have got their own interests. Of course, everybody has their own interests. And, and so you know, people will work up the sort of scientific hierarchies until they're in a position where they're in control of the pot of money, or at least have great influence over that pot of money. Yeah. And so there is a disincentive to fund people who might show up these, you know, sort of the people at the top of the pile for having made mistakes in their career. Now, of course, they've made mistakes in their career. You could ask them that and they would be very open about it. And they would say face to face with you that, of, you know, they have, would highly expect some of the things they'd found to change over time because that will happen. And that's absolutely fine. And, you know, they have the maturity to say that they accept that scientists in the future will find new things. But in a room with the pot of money, they don't want to be funding those people undermining their life's work. Of course they don't, because, you know, it's not going to look good for them when that happens. And so even if it's a really unconscious bias, it's a bias that exists. And in America, it's been the most extreme situation where Fauci has headed up the NAIAID part of... Massive, massive levels of control and power. Yeah, but he's an old man. <laughs> He's been in that position as director there for as long as some people's entire medical careers. So, you know, the, so the, the Max Planck expression that I was saying to you last time, that sort of, you know, science moves on one funeral at a time, you, you, that is a real problem if you've got this sort of very um, stagnant hierarchical structures of power and institutions within science, it is antithetical to science, which has to be disruptive. There is, and you know, that what's really sad is people have done studies on how much disruption there is in science, and it's just gone through the floor. So you can tell if something is disruptive if a paper gets referenced a lot because it becomes a new paradigm. So everyone's back to that paper saying, well, this was the one that showed us this. And the number of papers that achieve that has just been declining and declining and declining. Um, and so that, you know, that's proof, really, that we've got a problem with our scientific structures. And like the, the sort of more extreme um, model that, that I'm not saying we should go back to, but as a contrast, it's worth discussing, is what the Victorians did, where they didn't have any of these structures and they didn't have a way of funding money. And a lot of scientists would just be sort of sponsored by a rich person who, as a sort of they'd own a hobby scientist as, their, as a, you know, a way of contributing to society. Uh, Alfred Russell Wallace springs to mind. He was paid by rich collectors, yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's, that's got its own issues in terms of influence. Um, but they would also have prize money. So there would be, you know, for instance, the longitude problem was solved mm. by a massive prize. And the John Harrison, who won that, he was, um, you know, he was a, a, a clock worker and a woodworker, but he was doing it sort of in the back, in the garage equivalent of the time. And so, you know, he was really properly disruptive and came up with fantastic solutions, but all because the funding was totally unbiased, totally unbiased. It just wanted the solution. It didn't. It took them care. a long time to cough up, but they did eventually. And he, he was an old man by the time he got the money. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but no, no, the, it's, 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 a, it's a very good point. And Really, the, the big changes in science do come from paradigm shift. It's not a nibble here and a nibble there and a nibble there and a little bit there and a little bit there. You know, if you think about the big developments in science, I mean, plate tectonics springs to mind, where, where people believed in the fixity of continents. Then all of a sudden, it took decades for the evidence for the continents drifting around the place to come. And then all it changed almost overnight. There was like a paradigm shift. Mm. Or Albert Einstein um, um you know, coming out with the relativity ideas, 1905. Again, a complete paradigm shift in, in physics. And then 
even even in Einstein's life himself, people like uh, Niels Bohr coming out with uh, and uh, that guy in Copenhagen, I can't remember his name, um, coming out with uh, quantum quantum physics. Um, uh, you know, again, and, and this and Einstein didn't like it at all. Yeah. <laughs> he, didn't, he, did, he did not it, like quantum physics. Yeah, what yet, you, it, sorry, well, it shows, what it shows it, an aspect of truth. No, oh, totally. And and what you've seen with COVID is that this this sort of hierarchical structures and the and the power of the institutions are filtered really massively into the literature. So it, I mean, it's quite astonishing when you when you read any almost any COVID paper, and there's this kind of thing at the beginning where they sort of have to recite the scripture. You know, this is a very dangerous virus. It's killed this many people before they're allowed to say anything about their research. But very, very often I can come up with quite a number of papers where people have found important results. And so the results section is, you know, really important. And the method section seems completely honest. But the introduction, the abstract and the results have no bearing on what these scientists found. And it's almost like they have to sort of recite the scriptures and say the lines and present it in this distorted way. And then they get it published. And at least the results are out there. But it's really perverse. It's really, really perverse when you see it. Yeah, you can't book the narrative at the moment. The last one on this point, what's the difference between political truth and scientific truth, Claire? <laughs> it's not an unfair question. Yeah, well, I would just, I'd sort of see politics as being the opposite of science, that politics, <laughs> yeah. politicians are salesmen, ultimately. That's what they are. Yeah. Yeah, and they yeah, need yeah. a story yeah. they can sell. And when they sell it, they need you know, it needs to be sort of true. It's their truth. This is what the platform they're standing on. They can't have doubt. Doubt is bad for politics. It just makes them look weak. It makes them look like they are indecisive, unsure. So, yeah, they, they want certainty. And science is the opposite of certainty. Science is where the doubt, the doubt lies. And so when you've got this problem of science being owned by politicians, then it, it, it becomes horribly distorted. And, you know, as we touched on last time, the last kind of big, the, the last big example I have of that happening in science, at least in biology, was the germ theory story, where, you know, that was so politicised that, that it, it became extreme. And so the result of the politicisation is that people on either side of the argument entrench at these extreme positions. Yeah. And both sides lose all the nuance, just completely lose the nuance. Um, and, you know, I think that's exactly what we had with COVID, that when people are not being heard, they shout louder and they, and they exaggerate. And, and then they're more easily dismissed and it becomes even more separated and entrenched. And we're seeing this in so many, I hope we're not going to go into it now, but so many aspects of political thinking where we just see extreme positions, people living in their own echo chambers, hearing more and more about their own extreme positions and there the twain shall meet and it's not a healthy not a healthy situation i don't think no i totally agree and i i mean i just go you just wonder how on earth you get out of it and how do you reintroduce nuance when if you say something nuanced people sort of go yeah okay whatever but i'm not going to get excited and share that because that's yeah. sort of slightly dull <laughs> i know the answer to that one Claire. we listen to people like you uh, and uh, we, we talk about proper science and proper empiricism and proper evidence base. That is the that is the, the, the way to do it. And actually, I think people are getting sick of the hyperbole. Yeah. I think that you know you just actually can't sustain hyperbole for that long. Yeah. And so maybe that's right. Maybe we just keep talking about you know relatively dull nuance, and people will <laughs> yeah. come and listen because they just want some sanity. This is not remotely dull. It's making sense of the, the insanity <laughs> of the past few years, which is, is brilliant.